Hello and welcome to another episode of Grange TV. Uh, we have with us a very, very, very special guest today. Um, he's an active competitor in MMA from 95 to 2010. He's a Pride UFC Shudo Valetudo Japan veteran, ADCC competitor, um, the Shudo heavyweight champion of the world, the um, Japanese racquetball champion, if I'm not mistaken. You won all Japan, rac- you were all Japan racquetball champion? Yeah, yeah, before I started fighting. <laughs> yeah, and you were also in the film, uh, in the feature film, Rites of Passage, uh, and you were author of Live as a Man, Die as a Man, Become a Man. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are some accomplishments that I've uh, missed, but I'm sure we'll ha- – ha- any, any accomplishments that I missed right off the top of your head like that? No, that's about it. I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, and you you owned and operated an, a number of your purebred gyms. So your businessman. Oh, yes, the, purebred, the purebred gyms. Yeah, so businessman, entrepreneur. Again, another one of these uh, annoying overachievers that we have on this podcast. Um, so, Mr. Ensign Inoue, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, man. Um, man, I, I don't know where, really where to start with with your life and career, I suppose. Can we start with uh, w- what it was like for you growing up in Hawaii, I believe, um, as a, as a Japan, your, your mom and dad are Japanese? Yes. My mom and my, um, they're American, but they're Japanese blood. So my uh, great grandparents were actually Japanese citizens that moved over to um, Hawaii. Okay. In so, I'm going to kind of go back and forward. So you move, you ended up moving to Japan, but in Hawaii, did, did you ever experience like a kind of displacement in the fact that in Hawaii, you, you may have been seen as a Japanese, not a Hawaiian per se. And then in Japan, were you accepted as a Japanese or were you always an outsider? Well, Hawaii, Hawaii, um, the thing with Hawaii is a little different is, uh, it's very diverse in the different races that we have in Hawaii. So there's all the mixtures. They call it like the melting pot of America, where we have all different races. We have Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, Samoans, Tongans. They're all mixed together. So as far as prejudice, there was really um, not much prejudice being uh, Asian. But there was, a, um, <clears throat> you know, back in the day where the, you know, the Asians were quiet and they were smaller. So they were... Um, they were bullied a lot, picked on, um, money taken from them, from the Hawaiians. So, um, as far as there's no actually prejudice, it was just, uh, the fact that we're very, um, smaller in stature as far as physically. And, you know, we're, we're, we're hijacked in school. So there was a point in my life, um, being Asian, you know, being targeted by the bigger Hawaiians where you either, it was like almost fight or flight, you know, you either fight back or you, Run and give them, always give me your money every single time they ask, you know. So that was the furthest, that was the most part of, you know, the difficulties of growing up as an Asian. We're a lot smaller in uh, Hawaii. What, what's it like? So so run me through your, your childhood. Like, so say, for example, if we were at school together, who, who were you at school? Like, what what kind of kid were you? Were you... I was, uh, um, I academically was really good. I was always in the top classes in math. You know, you know, in grade school, they separate you into different, like the the um, higher class and the lower class. I was always in the higher class, so at the, academically, I was good. But as a child, I was really um, a rascal. I really like to play around. I I love to get in do mischievous, do mischievous things, get in trouble. So I was a good student, but I think behavioral problems. Maybe I would have a lot of my parents would have a lot of problems with. The teachers having to um, call them in for a parent-teacher conference where I'm, you know, I'm bothering the student or I'm making too much noise. I'm not listening to them. <laughs> were, were you and Egan close? Yeah, me and Egan were close. Um, fighting actually was what really brought us closer together. We're really um, two different types of people. Egan's more the safe, uh, quiet, um, honor roll, class president. And I was more the the radical, um, real rebellious uh, brother that um, you know didn't get. If they if they looked at Egan, they thought, "Oh, good class president." They looked at me, it was like, "Oh, Sergeant in Arms," you know, keep things <laughs> in control. How much older is Egan than you? 
he gets two years older. Because he he's he's a very interesting person as well because he he's he was also a racquetball player. He um martial arts he was a free diver as well is that am i correct with this or have i got him wrong with someone else yeah, he yeah. could free dive well, as far as racquetball egan was actually the racquetball player i was someone trying to be like egan never ever attaining the the level that he's gotten to but um egan egan is a real um special individual whenever he pursues something whenever first of all whenever he gets interested in something he goes full on and once he decides to go full on in something, he'll go to like a real elite level. I mean, as far as you know, what I can recall, he um, not just the martial arts, um, but his racquetball. He was he became the number one in the world. Yeah, he, 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 Egan was one of those people, you know. Like I, I when I, I used to watch him, like back in the day, and he made me. He, you know, people motivate you to do stuff. He made me not want to do anything because, like, he's like a good looking dude. He's good at racquetball. <laughs> he's fucking good at free diving. He's a good surfer. He, he's he, even in jujitsu. I think people don't like. He he has wins like over Henzo Gracie in in Abu Dhabi, like. And I think, like, dude, like, fuck it, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. You know what I mean? Like, he's just, <laughs> he's one of those dudes, man. Did you see what he's doing now on his Instagram and stuff? No, I didn't. I didn't. He's doing this thing called foil boarding, you know. And he started this like before anyone knew what foil boarding was, like three years ago. What's foil boarding? But, yeah, yeah. Most of them, people still don't know, but it's like a surfboard, but there's a fin that. <gasps> goes below the board yeah i've seen and it you actually it actually hovers you and pushes yeah you yeah like, yeah yeah damn it's like four or five feet above the water no you know now that you say it because i didn't know that it was called foil boarding but i live like right on the water on the new south wales south coast here in australia and i'm learning ah. to surf i'm learning to surf and there was a dude out there with that now as soon as now that you said what it was a guy said to me be careful because of that foil board i will chop you in half you know with a big big ass fin but um, he yeah. does. He said so he was doing that back in the day before it was trendy kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But that I hear that's even like I heard that's even harder than surfing. Are you a good surfer? No, I used to surf when I was uh, younger, but because of my the last time I went to Hawaii, I know actually like two years ago when I went to Hawaii, uh, my my girl started surfing, so I took her out to go surf with Egan. And fuck, I couldn't believe it. My my shoulder, my sh <laughs> the replacement, my shoulder. I couldn't paddle. I couldn't get this hand out of the water from a pre-existing injury. Yeah, from fighting, from uh, injury and fighting that I never really took care of. You know that, like with with surfing, people don't understand. Like just paddling out is such a workout. It's just yeah. fucking insane. Like I'm reasonably fit. I'm nothing special, but. When I um when I started now trying to paddle out, like th I'm trying to paddle out, and like there's little kids, like six, seven year olds, they paddle right past me, and then they, th that's bad. But the the worst one is I'm paddling, and then there's like sixty and seventy year old people paddle past me on this side, and like give me tips as they keep going, and I, I'm thinking like, man, I'm gonna fucking die here. I'm not. <laughs> it's like a it's like a conditioning that your body has to get conditioned to, yeah. A hundred percent, yeah, yeah. How's the, how's the, after having a nice session of surfing, how's the fucking paddle in, man? <laughs> Isn't that the worst? <laughs> Fuck. Y you know, you know what's the worst, man, is when you paddle all the way and then you try and catch a wave because I'm shit, I can't catch him and you fall and you just, so you don't get the ride and then you go all the way in or something and you have to, you know, you're going to have to paddle all the way back out. But paddling in is hard. <laughs> paddling in back to the beach, you mean, eh? If there's currents or yeah. whatever, yeah, it's, Fuck, and you get smashed too sometimes when you're when you're just beginning after with you me. Catch the, after you catch the wave as far as you can ride it, and then there's no more breaks, and you gotta paddle the rest of the way in. That's a fucking whole you like it's like every inch you move, it's a fucking chore, huh? Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> you, you, you you're smashed. Um so you growing up, what was growing up in Hawaii like for you? Um we're beach boys, uh, a lot of a lot of diving, a lot of surfing. Um, there was, I don't think there's like a, maybe there's a day out of the, there's a, maybe one day out of the week where I wouldn't jump into the ocean. So for me, moving to Japan where there's no access really to the ocean unless you live on the coast, 
I never imagined myself being somewhere that uh, I wasn't um, able to access the ocean every day. You know, like Hawaii, 24, 20, 365 days a year, you can swim, you know. But in Japan, man, forget swimming in the winter, you know. So for me, it's just uh, I've, I've surprised myself that I've been here for 30 years and now consider this my home. How much do you miss Hawaii, though? Um, I think I, in the beginning, in the first 10 years, I think I missed Hawaii a lot. But as uh, I've been in Japan, I I've, I've grew fond of the people, the country, um, even like the seasons changing, you know, the, the I hate the summers, but, you know, winters, snow, you know, for fall. In Hawaii, you don't see any, any, any uh, seasons change. So I don't think I miss Hawaii. I mean, when I get back to Hawaii, it's always nice to be home. But my longing is always to come back to Japan. So, so I think in your heart, Japan's home? Yes. It, there, for, I don't know when it happened, but there was a transition in me that went from my heart was in Hawaii to my heart is now in Japan. So, so when did that connection occur? Because you, you moved over there relatively young to play racquetball. Am I correct? Yes. I moved there when I was uh, 23. And how and, did that um, connection to Japan occur that you went, fuck, I'm Japanese? Well, it's, it's real ironic because when I first got to Japan, there was a, it went the whole t- opposite direction. I really didn't like Japan. Um, I, it was, it was a shock for me because when I, uh, you know, in Hawaii, there's all different races. So what nationality are you? Everyone's American. But for, for some reason, in Hawaii, when we were kids, we'd say our race. What nationality are you? I thought nationality was Japanese. I thought my nationality was Japanese, although I'm holding an American passport. So I consider myself Japanese. You know, I had friends that are Hawaiians, Chinese, Filipinos, but we always, I'm Japanese, you're Filipino. You know, it was always like that. We, we classified ourselves whenever we asked nationality, it was always Japanese. So I was always Japanese. I, I, the big shock for me was to come to Japan and they tell me I'm not Japanese. And there's the first time in my life I was called American. I was like, oh shit, I guess I am American, but I'm more, I'm from Hawaii, I'm Japanese. That, that's, what I was, no, you're not Japanese. that's what I was touching upon earlier when I was asking if there, you felt that displacement in when you got there feeling like, fuck, I thought I was Japanese, but apparently I'm not. Yeah, in Japan. Yeah. In Hawaii, there was no displacement, but in Japan, yeah, there's a huge, I mean, you know, Japan, they, no matter where you're from, if you're not from Japan, you're called a gaijin, which is translated as an outside person. So it's a very, it's, it's a very open type of xenophobia in Japan. I, I've been to Japan a whole bunch of times, like probably six, seven times. Love Japan. I absolutely love it. But I've had friends that live there and everything. And that's one of the things they say to me is like, dude, no matter how long you're here, you'll never, ever be, apart from the fact I don't look Japanese, but like you look Japanese, my wife is, is Asian, and no matter how long she's there or how long I'm there, you'll never be Japanese. Is that correct? Yeah, well, see, Japan, it's it's nearly impossible to break into the Japanese hearts and, and accept you, but if you are able to, they hold on to you. You know, like Japan, the whole system is protecting the Japanese people. I mean, it sucks as a foreigner coming in. There's a lot of injustices that happen. You know, you can't own a house, you can't own a car, you can't, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff that not being Japanese, you know, I can get a green card, but as soon as I get arrested for for any type of offense, my green card is canceled. So, you know, it, there's so many injustices that happen, but when you're taken in, you're really taken in. And I was fortunate enough to be <clears throat> taken in by the fans, you know, more so the people who know me here, I mean, not only consider me a Japanese person, they consider me, they, I've heard it a lot of times, they tell me I'm more Japanese than Japanese. Do you think that's like one of those things where you look, it's like, um, you know, when you, you're born again, you know, like the, the Christians that are, that are born again and they become like more hardcore. Did you always feel that connection to the Japanese culture or did you just go there and <laughs> then it just came out of nowhere kind of thing? Like uh, growing up, so, sorry, growing up in Hawaii, did you feel that you had to be, you, that you were repping the Japanese culture in Hawaii? And was that a connection or just? 
Yeah, well, when in Japan, our parents, you know, they held on to a lot of the Japanese beliefs and cultures. So, um, yeah, I, I did feel I was Japanese. I, I was representing the Japanese. You know, like um, when we get into street fights with the Samoans, it's like, yeah, fuck, Japanese aren't as strong, but they're smarter. You know, I mean, always the Japanese, this is Japanese, this is Japanese, that. And when I got here, it was like, I was, it was so, it was such a huge uh, change for me because from Japanese, I was more trying to prove that I'm not Japanese and I'm American. And, and how like if, you look, if you look at the beginning of my fights, I was wearing red, white, and blue shorts. Yes, you so were. Tight. I, I wore those because I didn't want them to think I'm Japanese. But then that's how. But then the Yamato, Yamato Damashi, did I, did I pronounce that correctly? The Yamato Damashi spirit thing was, was born at, after that? Or do you feel well, you always happened, had that? What happened with that was I was really resenting Japan because when I was trying to live frozen the visa owning things you know there was so much there was so much things that you couldn't do be or, or made it much more difficult because you're a foreigner so i resented that and i also got real um to another level of resentment when you know all these rules against me had made it really difficult to live there and when i went, when i finally got in and i got famous you know the first fight i got it was like fuck this guy knows gracie jiu-jitsu and it's like all of a sudden they're like they're wanting to put me down as Japanese national, and they're saying they're, the whole big article in my first fight was Japanese person knows crazy jujitsu, and it's like, oh, you guys all, up until now when I'm trying to live here teaching English and all this, you guys, I'm, I'm considered a foreigner, so I don't have all the privileges of the Japanese. They even charge you more tax because you're a foreigner. It's like wow, now that I'm famous, you guys want me in Japanese? Fuck you, I'm American. That's why I wore the red, white, and blue shorts. But there was a level of um, not being educated about how the Japanese people are. I just took it. I resented it because I felt like they're prejudiced. They're, 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 they have this thing against foreigners. But then when I started living here longer, <clears throat> I noticed it's not necessarily prejudice, but it's more um, the... The, the protecting the Japanese person. Right, right. And, and yeah, and, and it's like, the, you, you can kind of see why, because you have, um, you have this, you know, you know, like how they say that a few bad apples can ruin it for the rest of us. You know, there's, you have a lot of foreigners that come into Japan and because the Japanese are real quiet and they don't speak up, you know, they, they take advantage of that. They get boisterous, they get rude. I still see foreigners like sitting in the <clears throat> sitting in the elderly seats in the train, putting their feet up on feet. They don't, res you know, and, and sometimes in America, it's not bad. You know, like sometimes they put their feet up on the coffee table in someone's house and it's like, maybe it's okay in their culture, but they need to, you know, why, you know how they're saying when in Rome, man, you, you yeah, should 100%. understand the, the culture. Yeah. Yeah. I find, I guess that's probably, I don't know. I've always, I've always loved Japan. I've never had a bad experience there. And, um, I, I, I've never, like when people say, you know, like it's going to, you know, the culture thing on this, I've never had a problem with that. Like I wouldn't go to your house and irrespective of what, you know, if, if you ask for something ridiculous, I just won't go. But if, if you're eating with chopsticks, man, I'm going to eat with chopsticks. If you're going to, like, I've never really felt that I have to, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's not really a difficult thing. Fuck, man, you're going to another country. Just <laughs> do what's being asked. Can I ask you to speak on um, Yamato Damashi? Because it's a, am I saying that right? Am I messing that up? Yam Yamato Damashi? No, you're saying it good. That's good. That's exactly how it's said. Okay, can we can we can we speak on that? Because it's something that I've I've been interested in and forever with watching you fight and and I, I want to I'll go into it a little bit later on. But even outside of fighting is stuff that I think that's that's the part that people miss as well. Like, um, but can you sp can you speak to that a little bit? Okay, to go back in the history of Yamato Damashi, um, right now Japan. If you've been here, you probably know Japan is called Nihon. Yep. Right. Yep. Well, back in the day, back in the day in the the samurai era, it was called Yamato, and uh, the word Tamashi is spirit. 
So translated, it, it, it's translated as the Japanese spirit. So the the thing about that is you can't look at the modern day Japanese and look at the kids nowadays and say, oh, okay. So Yamadama stands for those people. No, it doesn't. It stands for the days of the samurai. So it's um, translated into samurai spirit. And the word um, as a whole was the, was abolished after the war. When America came and took over, they were, um, they were forbidden to you know speak too proudly of Japan. They were forbidden to go out of the country for war. They were forbidden to speak highly of Japan. Like Yamato Damashi was a word that was not supposed to be used because you're talking the Japanese spirit and America didn't want you to do that. They wanted to subdue the Japanese people. So there was a group of people that they're, they're, they're the right wingers. You know, if you've been in Japan, you see yeah, yeah. buses with big <laughs> flags on them. They're probably worse than Yakuza to have problems with. But they the, these are, are the, the one- far right, the far right, the extreme right. Far right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they held on so strongly to the Japanese tradition. I mean, you know, standing up for fuck America, Japan, we still stand on our own. So they are the ones who really um, started using that word a lot. So when a reporter who understood the word more deeply than just the right wingers, the right wing act- activist, he actually brought the name to me and said, hey, when I hear you talk and I see you fight, the one word comes into my head is Yamato Damashi. And I was like, wow, what does that mean? And he goes, well, he kind of translated to me as the fighting spirit, you know, the, the spirit that never gives up. So I thought, oh, that's cool. That sounds like a cool name. I never knew the depth of the word until I started looking like, looking into it. And when I started looking into it, you know, Yamato Damashi is the is not just the summer spirit, but it's the, the being a, a, a life of honor, the, the summer I live with honor. So it's like having an honorable life, which includes integrity, of course, you know, compassion, loyalty, you know, that type of stuff. So when when I felt that I was named that, I felt like it was I was probably named more for my fighting spirit. But it, something about the word just started, um, you know, taking over my 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 life, and and it, it started. Instead of me representing the word, I feel the word has guided me into a better life. So it was it was interesting because when I first uh, used the word, is I didn't really know the meaning when I first used it. I was going to the UFC 13 in 19, uh, 1997. It was in Augusta, Georgia, going to America. And I just felt the responsibility to represent Japan because my whole martial arts as a professional was born in Japan. And the opportunity to fight in the UFC was uh, because of my training in Japan. So I wanted to represent Japan as a fighter going over to uh, America. So I, my brother is actually Egan is the one who had the idea. He had this idea about how about we put make a T-shirt with kanji right across. I was like, that sounds cool. So we had all these ideas, kamikaze, but it's kind of like a crazy person. Yeah, kamikaze yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone like this. So okay, uh, maybe that's not cool. Ichiban, but it's like, ah, oh, but that's so boring. There's like one line on the first kanji. So, and then he had this idea, wow, three kanjis, Yamato Damashi. Would that be a cool shirt? So it was just pretty much with the way we first made the first shirts was only because we wanted to represent Japan and we thought that kanji would look real cool on the chest. So when I first made the shirt, we I wore it to UFC 13. I did well. And then we, and then we had people, Some we had a lot of fans calling to see if we're selling the shirt. So when when that happened, I thought, okay, maybe I should sell the shirt. When I started talking to some of my other, my other students in the gym about the idea, 90% of them shied away from it saying, <laughs> I don't want to wear that shirt because that, the, people are going to think I'm Yakuza or they call it Uyoku, which is a right wingist. So like, I don't want to, I, there's this. It's gonna look weird. So you, you know, that you know, was the first reaction. You know, one of the things is when um, just because of, of how I am, like ninety seven. You that was when you fought uh, Royce Algiers in. Is that am I correct? So so yeah. fast forward a few years, maybe early, uh, maybe ninety nine. You know, here in Australia, I'd go and get the VHS tapes, right, of the UFC and Pride. Yeah, VHS. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and so I watched those fights. Right, I watched all your fights, and. 
I was like, what does Yamato, Yamato Damashi mean? And so I looked it up and it was like, you know, but that was fuck probably before internet properly, you know, so I'd have to go to the library and get the the thing. Yeah. yeah. And and it was oh, all oh. dude, it, but this like Google wasn't really a thing, you know what I mean? Like yeah. so I had to go like library, type the thing in, find the book, read up Yamato Damashi, and all I could read about was like extreme hardcore right wingers. And I was like, Fuck, this is good. this is interesting. But then the way you spoke, it wasn't like um and I don't want to make this it's not a political um thing, but I'm saying like you didn't sound like a like a extreme right wing yeah, 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 yeah. Japanese person. And I remember saying to my mate, and um if he's watching this, like you know, he'll remember because we were like, What do you think's up with that guy, with that Japanese guy? Like he seems like to be <laughs> no 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 offense, that don't, don't get angry at me. But I was like, he seems to be mixed up because like what he's saying and the way he is, he seems him and his brother seem like good guys, but he's rocking this hardcore right wing thing so hard, you know what I mean? And we were both confused. He, he, like he's actually my brother in law. Uh, the the guy ends up ended up being my brother in law, and we were both like, "Fuck, what what do you think that guy's goal is?" But now I'm so glad. But I, I mean, since then, I know, I, I know, I followed you enough to know that. You're yeah, actually talking about the Japanese spirit, but it, it was funny to me because I was like, "He's this guy in Australia in like the year 2001, looking it up, going, fuck, I think Ensign's confused in here.' <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, hey, you know the funny thing is, it's not just you guys. Even in Japan, the people in Japan were confused. They didn't under, you know, it's so funny because <clears throat> after the World War II, when Japan, um, when America abolished the word, the Japanese listen so so properly that a lot of the young generation didn't understand what the word was and when they saw it they 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 ref, they you they reflected it to the right wing so a lot of my students were didn't want to wear the shirt because they didn't want to be represented like that <clears throat> and like for example when if i would wear the shirt when i first made the shirts when i walked through like shibuya or you know somewhere crowded I get a lot of people chuckling, laughing, staring at me, looking at the shirt, pointing at me. You know, people didn't understand the word. And what really, um, I understood the word. And I, I just knew that these people were ignorant and didn't understand the word. You know, I asked when I go to interviews and I, you know, the reporter starts talking to me about something. I stop and I say, hey, I have a question for you. They say what? I said, what does Yamato Damashi mean exactly? They couldn't answer it. They looked at me like, uh, never give up. Strong spirit. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much all they could, uh, they could do. They, they really didn't understand the word. It was a uh, real interesting one day. I was at a TV show in Japan. I went into the bathroom at the urinals. It was, it's just weird that it was at the urinals, but I'm just telling you exactly how <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was standing at the urinal and there was an older, elder guy, probably about 70s taking a pee right next to me. He looked at me and he goes, as we're peeing, he looked at me and goes, Ensign Inoue. And I let it kind of bounce at Adomo. And he goes, Arigato. And I'm like, whoa, Arigato? What do you mean, Arigato? Arigato doste? Why, why are you asking me that? Why are you telling me that? He said, thank you from the bottom of my heart for bringing Yamoto Damashi back, bringing that word back. And I do feel today that I play as, as although I'm just one person, just one fighter, I play a huge part in Japan for having more that this now, this young generation understanding the true meaning of the word. And so when, when it's we no longer, it's no longer, it's no longer used as just a right, right, ex right wing extremist. You got like the Olympic soccer team using it. You know, they understand what it is now, the, the pride of Japan, the Japan spirit. It's a proud thing now. It's not something to be laughed at or be ashamed of anymore. And I, I, I do feel and I do feel privileged to be able to say that I have probably played a huge part in that. When when you're speaking about Yamato Domashi, yeah, there, there's also like kind of going into your fights, but then, you know, we're going to come back and forwards between stuff because it's, it's something that, that, you know, hearing you speak, reading interviews, to be fair, mainly I read a lot of your interviews back, back in the day, you know? Um, but say when you talk about 
Let's talk about the fight, which you know, I'm sure you've spoken about this fight probably 35 million times. But um, correct me if I'm wrong and if I'm paraphrasing. I am paraphrasing, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you fought Eagle Vachemchin, and in that fight, it was about you facing your fears, you you growing as a man, you growing as a person. And that is part of your, your Matsu Damashi, is it not? Because the samurai wasn't like they didn't. They they didn't fear death, but they they were prepared to die for whatever they were doing. Am, am I correct with that? Am I kind of yeah? Well, Yamato Damashi is the you know is the is the is the spirit that would it's it's like a spirit that would never die, would never give up. So the Igor fight was more of sort of like a confirmation to me and the people around me that I do have Yamato Damashi in my spirit. I have I have the spirit of Yamato Damashi. Can you speak about conquering your fear, dealing with your fear, and that particular fight? Yeah, um, well, see, the Igor fight was not something that was not something that help me with Yamazamashi. It was more of a confirmation. Yeah, yeah. So, so I say there is a Yamato Damashi moment. So a Yamato Damashi moment could vary for every individual. So what could be a Yamato Damashi moment for you may not be for me. Yeah. Because right now, say for example, if I if someone tells me that I have to walk two hundred miles or maybe say a thousand miles with no food or water and you got to find it on the way somehow that doesn't scare me but for most people it would scare them to a point of they they really believe that it's not possible so for me to do something like that to set off on a on a moment like that and accomplish it would not be a yamato damashi moment for me because i didn't fear it to a point where i thought it was impossible so a Yamato Damashi moment varies from each person. Like for a person, a regular person, that will be. So in the eager fight, there was never a time where I feared or thought I was going to die. I was prepared to die, but I never felt I was going to die or thought I was going to die. So I never had to overcome any type of fear. It was just a confirmation for me that I have a strong spirit. Yeah, so... Um, I, I call it a Yamato moment where there's a moment where it could be something as simple as training where you're hitting a pad and your, your teacher's making you go in such a vigorous pace that you feel that you can't continue. Like you really feel in your heart that this is your last round, man. I can't, I mean, I only got 10 more punches, but he wants me to do five more minutes. And I really feel inside that I just want to fall on the ground. I just want to drop down or even, even pretend that I can't go anymore and just t tell them I, I'm done, I, I, I'm broken. When you really feel that moment, you feel like doing that in your heart and you continue, then you've actually built yourself. And I, could, I call that a young Dhammashi moment. There's a book called um, The Gift of Fear, and I don't know who it is that wrote it. I can't remember who wrote it. But um, they speak about people dealing with fear. And so they speak about in, in that book, uh, pub, one of the things is public speaking and the, the fear that people, <laughs> the fear that people feel, not, not everyone feels it like, but, but, you know, the fear that people feel is being ostracized from the village. You know what I mean? Being ostracized. That's what they actually fear. Not so much the actual speaking, but, you know, saying something dumb or not doing it properly. And then everybody ostracizing them. So for someone that's not good at public speaking, coming out and getting up in front of a group of people and speaking is, that's the Yamato, Yamato Damashi yeah, I, moment, I, I'd imagine. Yes, 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 yes. Because when I was reading that book, I thought of, I thought of you and I thought like, this, this is what, what you mean in as far as dealing with fear, because for some people that wouldn't be a big deal and for others, it it would it be to like one of the greatest fears is public speaking. Yeah, for me, you know, it's it's 
I, I don't look at a speaker that can speak really well and be inspired by him going doing like a huge speech in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people smoothly. I get more inspired as someone that has that fear. And even though the speech doesn't go as smooth, you can see them struggling, but they they push through it. That type of person will inspire me more than the person that can speak perfectly in front of a crowd. Yeah, a hundred percent. One of the things is like, you know, when you, uh, unfortunately, and fortunately, unfortunately, I, I think it's great that, you know, people look up to athletes because athletes are, uh, it's a universal language, like music and whatnot. But I, I see, say, for example, um, a fighter, he's going to step into the cage, but he is a fighter and stepping into the cage is, I'm not saying he's not nervous. I'm not saying he's not scared, but he is comfortable, reasonably comfortable. And then I think of like, say a surgeon a brain surgeon and they said to him you can't operate on this kid or you shouldn't operate on this kid because you can't but he knows that if he doesn't operate on this kid the kid's gonna die and he knows that if he operates even if he saves his life he's gonna be jeopardizing his career and he does it anyways that to me is like that guy's over you, you'll never hear about him but that's overcoming a fear that's that's something that we should stop and go oh fuck you know whereas a guy that's a good runner or a good thing well he's doing what he's meant to be doing i'm not saying that there aren't hardships but it's a different it, it, but we only look at at those guys that are in the public eye if you i don't know if i made sense with what i said yeah it makes sense and overcoming your fears isn't not feeling fear it's overcoming it means like being able to feel the fear, but controlling it enough that you can still continue to do the task at hand. Yeah. Can in um one of the one of the fights that comes it just keeps coming in my head. You beat Randy Couture when Randy Couture was on top. When Randy was he just beat him Vito, if I'm not correct. Yeah, it was, he was so undefeated, he vacated the UFC belt because of some type of uh, a business problem with Dana. But he was the, actually considered the, the UFC champ. Yeah, he, and he just beat Vitor, and Vitor was called the Phenom, where no one could touch him. Dude, he looked like a genetic engineer's wet dream when, when, he beat, when, when Randy beat him. And then you beat Randy. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was crazy. Can you, can you talk on that fight? Can you speak about that fight? Just run us yeah, through what I'll, you were thinking because people didn't think you were going to beat Randy. Like people wouldn't have thought that, but you did, yeah, when, you, you did was, a good, you know, like you, you, you were, you were like spot on, like the calf kicks and that, and the leg kicks from the bottom, from your bum. Well, when I, when I was offered Randy, of course, you know, I was still a fighter up and coming and Randy was at the top. And, you know, I, I felt like, you know, that's a little bit over my head, but I got nothing to lose. So I went into that fight with the mentality that, yeah, 99 out of 100 times, Randy will probably beat me. But whenever you go into a fight, you can't walk 99 roads or 100 roads. There's only one road you can walk. And if the walk, the road that you walk, if you have 100 roads to walk, the one that you choose, all 99 others don't matter. So if that one road is the road to it that leads me to victory, all those 99 that he can win has nothing to do with the fight. So for me, I went into the mentality that, hey, I have that 1% chance. Randy's human. If I get a proper arm bar in him, I'll break his arm. If I get a deep choke in him, I'll put him to sleep. I mean, he's not superhuman as people, you know, sometimes image someone that, that that's that good. It's, they kind of see him as superhuman, but he's not. So I went in that mentality thinking that, you know what? Yeah, he is better than me. The percentage of him is winning, but it's not 100%. I got a chance and I just got to train hard enough to make sure that there's a more of a possibility of that 1% happening for me. And what was the strategy that behind that? Like, what's that? What was the strategy that you had in your mind? Like, how did you guys come up with a strategy with Randy? Well, my strategy was just to, um, 
train as hard as I could, become the best ensign that I can, and let let everything fall into place. I wasn't like thinking, okay, this is how I'm going to fight him. This is how I'm going to do it. All I knew is I had a style that was really aggressive, and and I was going to fight the same way. The only thing that I the strategy wise that I did work on a lot was I noticed he was really good at um dirty boxing, which was he enabled his Greco Roman. Yeah, you know, upper body clinches, upper body t- neck ties. So I I went into a, a college school here in Japan, and and I just every every day wrestled with the Greco Roman guys. So I got real used to it, a lot of Greco Roman techniques and Greco Roman tie ups. So that helped me a lot in that. So as far as strategically, that's the only thing I did strategically. The the other thing I wanted to do was um, they they. In Japan, they didn't care how much tape you put on your ankle or your shin. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I made freaking casts on my leg. My leg had like two rolls of tape on each freaking leg. And they didn't they they didn't even care whether because I remember your legs being taped up. Yeah, but it was bad. I, I mean, you know those uh, white electrical tapes, the ones for athletes. I put a whole a roll and a half <laughs> about all on the front of my shin. Like I only had like a one wrapping around to hold it in, but the rest was all layered like a cast over my shin. It was like a rock. And my image was what I wanted to do with Randy was he had the confidence. He was the man, but I wanted to make an impact in the beginning to show him that hey. I don't give a fuck. So my whole idea was I was going to walk in, whichever leg was forward, I think his right left leg was forward, so I was going to walk in like a southpaw, step in, and with my fucking heavily taped shin, I was imaging just breaking his leg. So that my whole thing with the beginning was just an impact on letting him know that I'm not like everyone else and you're, 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 your fame and your level of, uh, you know, the level that you're at doesn't intimidate me. And I wanted to let him know that, hey, you're dealing with a different type of guy. So that's how, if you watch the video again, I stepped yeah. in and I saw his left leg forward and I stepped in with my left leg and, and just laid on a heavy leg kick on him. I didn't care about what would happen after. I just wanted that impact. And of course, he took me down. We got went to the ground as soon as I stepped in with that kick, yeah. But then afterwards, he he must have felt your 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 hips and your ground game because he got up. He wasn't in your guard. Is am, am I- well, I had him. I almost locked in a triangle. Yeah, and he, he won- stood up to. Yeah, he stood up to get me out of it, and that's when we ended up. You know, we, I, and you know my whole my whole style of fighting was always be on the aggression. You know, kill or be killed, and I wasn't going to wait to be killed, so I was out. To go and kill him so when when he stood up and i'm laying on the ground my whole thing was about how can i hurt him so i look saw his legs i tried to get his legs i noticed that the legs were very mobile so i decided to go for the upper body and kick the upper body so it wasn't really something that i planned to do it wasn't like oh when i get down i can kick his body i can do this it was an instinctual thing the desire to aggress desire to take him out before he takes me out create made me do and react and do the things that i did in that fight but you cracked him from the bottom though did you, yeah, you, you, you never practice that kicks. but you never practice that yeah we used to we used to throw kicks from the bottom throw side side kicks to the knee you know that type of stuff even in the frank shamrock fight i i used i used like from the bottom when they're standing up i would heel you know drop a heel right onto his foot try to break his foot so we noticed that laying on your back is not necessarily a submissive or defensive position. It can also be used as a aggressive position that people didn't expect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going to the Frank Shamrock fight, you because I, I want to ask you something, and it's about the Frank Shamrock fight, but it's also about a lot of your fights. When you went out, you fought an eagle, and you fought him the way that you did. When you fought a Frank Shamrock, and Egan was in your corner. Is, am I correct? Am I thinking this correctly? The fight didn't – either Shamrock kept going a little bit and Egan ran in. Is that correct? Uh, uh, no, that was a real confusing thing because back in the day, the Shuto Association had a rule that there was a standing eight count. Ah. You know how the fighter standing has a standing eight count? 
whenever they get knocked down, there's a standing eight count. So <clears throat> that was a rule. And when I got knocked down, I guess um, when the ref was trying to separate Frank to give me the standing eight count and Frank continued, I think Egan just that, that brotherly love just made him overreact. And he just felt like, I got to protect Ensign. And when he saw the ref having a hard time stopping Frank from properly separating and giving me a standing eight count, he ran in to take the initiative to, to stop Frank from hurting me. So that's actually what happened in that. But I don't look at it as a disqualification. They, they labeled it as disqualification because Egan ran into the ring. But I never liked the standing eight count. I always thought that if you're standing and you get a standing eight count, why don't you get a standing eight count if someone's mount punching you and you get rocked with a mount punch? They should stand you up and give you a standing eight for the mount. You know, so standing eight. Did that, so I, standing eight in MMA is it's it's kind of it's it's redundant it's it's silly yeah yeah because there's a next continuation after the people go to the ground like in kickboxing or boxing there's no continuance on the ground so i can understand the standing gate so i was always against that so when that happened um frank knocked me down i really believe that there's no such there shouldn't be such a thing as a standing eight count so you know if, if there wasn't a standing eight count frank would have probably been able to jump on me and finish the fight so you know I, I'd rather they change the record to a KO instead of a disqualification. I believe it was a KO. Okay, okay. And segueing into the next part, which I was going to say to you, when you fought the way that you fought against, I'll bring up Igor again, but you fought him in like, with your skill set, there's probably, you know, you, you could have taken him down or you could have tried to take him down. Is it hard for Egan to watch you fight like that? Was it hard for Egan? Is it hard for you to watch Egan fight? But is it hard for Egan to watch you fight in a way that he might be thinking, fuck Ensign, try and take him down? And I don't well, know. I I'm not never, privy to any of this, so I'm just asking. I would have never I would have never been able to answer that because I was never in Egan's shoes. And Egan doesn't fight like me, so I never had that pressure. But recently, my my girl started fighting. And she's bullheaded like me, where she stands toe to toe. Her name is Sarah McCann. Okay. She goes by the fight name Sarah. Sarah. S E R A. Okay. But if you Google some of her fights, it's like she just stands toe to toe with people. And it was funny because one of, after one of her fights, that she just stood toe to toe, like not even moving her face, just getting hit and trading hits with this girl. Someone walked up to me after the fight and they told me, Oh, uh, so you know how Egan felt now for all your fights, and I was like, "Holy shit, that that sucks, man." <laughs> well, that that's that, that's funny you say that, man, because like I always thought, "Fuck, imagine being and he's Egan's your older brother too." So, no matter, look, I, I'm an older brother, and I always have that thing like I'm 40 now, my sister's 35, and I always feel like we're 15 and 10. Do you, do you get what I mean? I always feel the same way. I never feel like we'll, we'll be 80 and she'll be 75 and I'll still feel like I'm the older brother, if you know what I mean. And you got to take care of her. Yeah. yeah she, if When she hears this, she'll be like, oh, you don't fucking have to take care of me. I'm a fucking, I have a master's degree and blah, 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 blah. But you, you know, you just have that and you obviously can take care of yourself. But for Egan, I imagine just he would always feel that like he did in that in that fight with the shamrock fight and you would feel that for your for your partner is is it hard yeah, watching a bang out like that toe to toe yeah i you know you know the thing with that is is i think understanding the person actually in there helps because if it was just you know a regular person and egan was a i was a regular brother and egan i think it would have been a lot harder for egan but I think for Egan, knowing what I was, you know, like I'd rather go down on my shield than for him to have protected me from it. I think they would have done a lot more damage in my heart to not be able to have continued to see how I could have done. And I think he knows that about me. So as he was singing and the, that brotherly love made it hard for him to watch, he also knew that it would have been harder for me if he stopped it. Right, right. So I think that made it a little easier. And I always gave them the, you know, that, that line, you know, that there was going to be no towel in the corner. And 
they, they are not to stop fights. So they understood that too. So I, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the instinctual care of a brother to, to be concerned for my safety was probably something hard for him to see. But same with me, with Sarah, when I see her fight, you know, I know it's hard for me to watch it, but it's easy for me to let it continue knowing her personality and that she would be, she would be gutted way more if I stopped the fight rather than, you know, if I, you know, if she get, ends up in a hospital with broken fractured orbital and, you know, reconstructive surgery and takes her six months to recover, she would have probably suffered more if I stopped it early, threw in the towel and never gave her a chance to experience it. So, you know, understanding that about the person, I think it, it's a lot easier to be able to watch and let it happen. Do you, do you have, you, is that like a, a Maori tattoo on your arm? Yes. Is she Maori? Yes, yeah, she's Maori. Well, then you don't have to worry, mate. They can fight. <laughs> the, the yeah, no shit. <laughs> you're telling me. My little fucking Maori warrior, bro. <laughs> yeah, that, you just let them go, man. They, they, you just uh, let, let them fight. They, 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 fight. they can fight. So she- yeah, this, this tattoo actually represents her eerie, iwi and her river, you know, her hometown river, her iwi and, you know, her, 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 her goddess of protection on the on my wrist right there, you know. So I felt I when I first when it first came about about me getting a getting one on my arm, I kind of felt like okay, I'm I'm Asian. Is that disrespectful? But the people who wanted to put it on was very people who are very prestigious in the in the art of tomoko. Yeah. So if they were okaying it. And she has this uncle Derek that's really high up in the in that community, and he's there saying it's cool. I didn't think I was I had any um, rights over them to say I'm not I should I shouldn't represent it because if they think I can represent it, I it was an honor for me. And the, the so yeah, that's, the Tamuko is is yours and yours alone, eh? Like nobody else can have the that the like no one can copy the the Tamuko. Yeah, well. They're, they're not supposed to, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I have so many fans that copy my tattoos. And, like I have people that ask me for a picture of the of my tattoo on my leg because they want to put one exactly like it. You know, <laughs> it's kind of flattering in a way. But yeah, 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 yeah. And I, um, in in uh, Pride, and uh, another one, another question, another not even a question, just another thing, another topic that I wanted to speak to you about was um, and may you rest in peace, uh, Kid Yamamoto. He, you, you were you were instrumental in his success coming up as a as a young fighter, w were you not? Yeah, well, I not many people know him, but I'm the one who brought him into MMA, and I coached him for the first four years. He was suspended guided, hey, from wrestling. Was is it more correct? Was he suspended from wrestling? That's why he went to you. Yeah, he was suspended from wrestling, and um, he, first of all, he was in trouble with the yakuza. I got him out of that problem. And then because of the problem with the Yakuza, he was uh, kicked out of his school and suspended from wrestling. Ah, can, can, what, what did he do that he was in trouble with the Yakuza? Um, he, uh, with, he and with, you know, they have these air pistols in Japan. It's not as bad as American ones where it penetrates the skin. When I was 15, it's they took it off me at the airport. I couldn't bring it back. Yeah. The, so the Japan ones are more like they're softer and it, it just yeah, hurts. Yeah. It, it stings. So he was playing around with that with his friends in the town, shooting each other. And apparently a stray bullet went and hit a, one of the Yakuza oh, guys on the face. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I know. That, that's unlucky. But what happened was that Yakuza guy um, followed him home and, and he actually had to jump off his balcony to get away from them. Oh, was that full on? Yep. So what happened with that was in the it, the word got in the school that he was having yakuza problems. The school wanted nothing to do with him. They kicked him out. And when the wrestling association heard about the problem, and he got kicked out of school, they suspended him for two years from competing in wrestling. Two questions I have. So how entrenched are the? So for example, if you had a problem in with the underworld here in Australia and you were at university, you're not going to get suspended from university. They're, they're two completely different worlds. But in Japan, if you have a problem with the Yakuza, the Yakuza, 
that problem can get you suspended from university? Yes. If they go to the school and start causing trouble to the school, that's the way the school will get rid of the problems, get rid of, get rid of what the Yakuza doesn't want. So next question is how much pool does a Yakuza have in Japanese society still to this day? The, the, um, it was more, more prominent back in the day. It's, 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 they're losing control a lot now, but back in the day, every single business had association to Yakuza. Schools, promotions, Coca-Cola, every single business to operate in Japan would have a connection to Yakuza. So a multinational company like Coca-Cola, if they wanted to start uh, a, a branch in Japan, they would have to go through the Yakuza? Not necessarily through, but there would there will be a point in their their in their um, procedure of uh, establishing a company. They would have to encounter Yakuza. They would have to work through or with Yakuza. How, when you say encounter, does like you have to pay a fee or like what would you have to do? Yeah, you either pay a fee or you hire some of their guys or you you pay a free you, you pay a fee to them to stand by the company in case other underworld figures try to get involved or cause trouble so look like a like a mafia yeah so in other words sometimes you're paying them a fee to protect them protect yourself <laughs> from them from them yeah yeah and so so um how did you Squash the problem with the Yakuza and um, Kid. Because of my fighting and because of the way I am, I've, I've um, uniquely been able to get respect and fear from the Yakuza. They feared me and they respected me. So I knew a lot of guys... They knew if they didn't, if I didn't know them, they knew about me. I was a real prominent name in the underworld. And all I had to find out is where it happened, what group it was from. And if I didn't know someone in that group, I knew someone high enough that he could call the group and say, hey, can you lay off, man? This is my friend's friend. And, you know, so that's what happened. I just made a few calls and. They got in touch with the top guy there, and the top guy called the, the guy he had a problem with was a lower guy. How heavily entrenched were you in that world, in that underworld, in the Yakuza world? Um, I was never I was never at a Yakuza. I was never asked to become a Yakuza. You know, there's a lot of rumors that Ensign is Yakuza, but I'm not Yakuza. Um if you if I've done, if you want to say I've done business, yeah, maybe I've done a little business with them. Maybe I've helped them with some things with security. Maybe, you know, if I have friends with Yakuza, I have friends. Do I have people that I call brothers that are Yakuza? Yes, I do. So my whole involvement started because they are attracted to me because of my fighting. And they come to me because they respect me and they, they, they fear me, but they, they really look up to me as a fighter. And, you know, like like any type of profession, if you're Yakuza, dentist, lawyer, doctor, whatever it is, there's a bad egg. So, you know, I've had, I have all types of guys come up to me. You know, I had guys that are totally not my style. These guys that like to flaunt their power. They like to walk and cause trouble to people. You know, I had a bunch of different types of Yakuza people approach me. And I've made a very good selection on who I choose to just be acquainted with and who I choose to become really close to and become like a family member with me. So, yeah. Were, were you, you like for you to get to a position where from, from what you're saying, you were an, almost an arbitrator, mediator of sorts with the underworld. Um, you would have had good run-ins, bad run-ins, neutral run-ins. As a foreigner, how do you reconcile that with being able to live there and because there'd be only one ensign so to speak like it's quite a large target like how how do you reconcile all of that well I, i've gained a lot of respect and fear 
I got a lane of respect from the people, from the Yakuza people because of how I handled some problems, the way I've handled a lot of stuff, even legal problems, you know, saying that's not underworld related. So they respected my style. They respected the honor that I lived by. Yeah. And so I think they, they really saw me as an honorable samurai where they believed that what I did and what I, what I decided was a real proper thing. So <clears throat> a lot of the mediations happened when I knew both sides of the group. So you actually were a mediator? Yeah, I did a lot of mediation. I made a lot of money from it too. Because oh, because when I said like an arbitrator mediator, I, I, I didn't know you actually mediated. Yes. Oh, oh, fuck. So... So if there was a group that had a, like, I, there was a group that had a problem with another group, they knew, I, I knew both sides. So with the group that having a problem, they would call me and say, hey, can you, there's, this Tokyo group was having a problem with the Osaka group. And they said, you know, can you talk to them? So I, I you know, I can't just hear one side. So I, so I'd go to the one side, listen to them. Then I call my friends in Osaka and say, "Hey, I, you know, I hear you guys having problems. With this. Can I talk to you?" And they, they, you know, that that's that's where my the respect comes in that they allow me to get involved in it. Because most regular purpose, they'd be like, "What the fuck, you? Who the fuck are you? This is our problem. Fuck off." But because I was who I am, they respected me. It's okay. And it's come come down. So I went down, heard their side. I I heard a little discrepancies that are a little different in both sides. So I usually made the decision to get them all in one room. And out of the respect and a bit of a fear towards me, I made them agree that there was going to be no physical bloodshed during the meetings and it was just going to be talk. And they're, they're honorably enough to honor that every single time. So we got him into the room. I hear one side and I hear the other side in front of each other. And they can even, sometimes they would talk over, you know, like the guy saying his story and they would, they would, Go again. No, that's not true. You know, then uh, so we'd work, we'd hash it out. It'd take hours sometimes, sometimes days. And I come to a conclusion. And if that one group had to, you know, they, they borrowed $200,000. This is a certain instancing I actually am imaging right now that happened is the, the group that owed, they borrowed 200000 from this group, but they didn't feel they needed to pay it back because of this, this, and this, and this. And they felt like the, the two, 200,000 would be like, sort of like a compensation for what you guys did to me. I had to deem with the, whether that was fair, that wasn't fair, maybe just half. But in that certain situation, the, the, what happened aside from the $2,000, $200,000 was totally irrelevant to the, the borrowing of money. So I deemed that it was proper for the person that borrowed the money to pay them back. Right. And when I, when I mentioned that, you know, of course, they, they, they didn't think so, but because I thought so, they, they respected it. And they paid them back. Now, now, for you to get into that sort of position in, in that underworld, you – you would have obviously had to have your own conflicts leading up to that. Like you, you it wouldn't have just been all like, Hey, Ensign's here. We respect him. We like him. Let's listen. Like throughout the years, you would have had to also climb, climb the ranks, so to speak, to get to a point where. Well, there was a, there was a, yeah, there was a couple instances where I felt I was done unjust by a, Yakuza. Have you been in danger like yourself? Staff? What's that? Have you been in danger yourself from the Yakuza? With threats, but never actually in danger. So with this certain incident, it was a Yakuza that um, when I, this these two Yakuza's I was close to asked me to open up a gym. So I agreed and I said, okay, they'll, they'll finance everything and they agreed to give me a $20,000 um, gift to thank me for allowing them to open up a gym. And my only requirement to them was to hire my student to work at the gym so they can get a salary and they can, you know, do the fighter's dream, make a, make a living fighting. Cause most of the fighters back in the day had to work a job and fight at the same time. So that's where, um, 
I got Yamamoto, Kid Yamamoto to work at the gym. Right. And that was the Killer B, Killer B gym. So that gym was established and run by Yakuza. So that Yakuza guy, um, I, you know, I put him in charge of the gym and I made sure that he overlooked Kid. Kid, uh, Kid was a type that, you know, fame and money was kind of like a poison to him. He started changing a little bit. He started getting a little too big for his britches. And I felt that before I go and discipline Kid, I thought it was their duty. So I called that guy. His name was AG. I, I got it written in my book, this whole thing. But I called AG and I told AG that, hey, uh, Nori, Nor we, Kid is actually, his name is Nori. And so I said, hey, Nori's doing this and that and that. Get on him, man. Straighten that shit out. And he said, I'll take care of it. Three months pass, nothing is done. The kid's still acting arrogant. He still hasn't been put in his place. So I I take responsibility. I think he's responsible for it. So I get angry at him and I call him and say, hey, hey we need a meeting. He knows the meeting is going to be a little physical. So he avoids it. Avoids my calls, avoids everything. And I, he avoids me for like six months. And so at this, at this stage, I'm a little upset. And okay, avoid me, hide out from me. Okay, fine, I can respect that. But in the midst of him avoiding me, um, kid fights in this uh, event called Heroes, and he beats uh, Carl Uno. I remember that fight. Yeah, he won that event, and I'm watching that event, and I see this guy Ag jump into the ring, hugging kid. I'm like, okay, now he just disrespected me. He's hiding from me, avoiding me. But he's going on national TV and hugging my student in front of me. I, I just lost it. And I instructed my students to find out where the after party was going to be. And we went down to the after party. We went down to the after party. Um, I had my students go in and call the guy out. He came out into a park and I beat him to a pulp. As I was beating him, I guess, kid them, everybody, the word got out to his group that I was beating the guy up. So this, the, the high, really high up guy, this guy called Hasegawa, he came out. And in the midst of beating him up, this guy, I mean, I, I like to describe it as like fucking monkeys coming out of the bush, man. These three Yakuza guys come out of the bush in the park that I was beating up Asian. Like, like, you know, talking, you know, screaming in that room, their tongues at me. And I had some of my guys, I had some of my, you know, I had a bunch of, there was a bunch of other Yakuza that came down that was a mutual friend to both of us. There was one guy, Tanaka, that kept bowing to me, asking me to forgive AG. And I would push him aside and then uh, punch AG in the face again, you know. So I had a bunch of guys there. And these guys came for me and the guys that were there kind of stepped in between telling them to, you know, hey, hey, hey wait, 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 hold on. Because they, I, I just found out like a couple of years ago, I, I had dinner with Hasegawa and he too, we were, we were recalling that story. And he, he told me that when they heard it was me, the three guys that went with him, they all had weapons. I didn't know that. So they came out with a, with a little, like a little aggressive demeanor. And my guy stopped them. And I looked at him. I said, fuck. I said, hey, Hasegawa, you got a problem with this? Let me just say one thing to you. And if you think it's you still justify this, we can get it on, you know? And so they let him go. He came up to me. I said, hey, I said, if someone fucked you over and disrespected you and you only punished them 10% of what you really wanted to because of respect to the family, I said, wouldn't you think that's cool? And he looked at me. He goes, 10%? Fuck, the guy was all bloody. Yeah, he had, I think he had a broken, fractured orbital, but he's all bloody, but he was standing, yeah? So he goes, 10%? What the fuck is this? This isn't 10%. I looked at him, I said, Hasegawa, I said, I've been beating him up for 20 minutes. I said, you think if I gave even 50% of what I could do and for 20 minutes, you think he'd be standing? And he looked at me and his whole demeanor changed. And he looked at me and he said, fuck, he said, Man, then he kind of changed to a point where he was like, kind of like asking me, like, Ensign, the Yakuza is all about their face. If they're busted up, it, it shows they don't have enough power. If they collect money. They need to 
looks strong. He said, without his face, he can't fucking work. So he told me, can you not do any more? And I said, you know what? I've done enough. And he said, and then he, I remember Hasegawa telling me that and said, please stand down. And I promise you, if he doesn't do or make up to you what he's done, I'll kill him myself. And for me, that was enough to hear. I stepped back and me and Hasegawa actually became really good friends and I'm still in touch with him today. Fucking. So that was, yeah, you know, that kind of stuff happened to me two or three times already now. And I've had problems where the higher up comes out, but I always made it a point to always work in the proper, you know, do the proper routine. Don't, don't do anything unfair. Don't, don't do anything wrong. So I always made sure it was, they did something wrong to me and it was my honor that was, you know, dented and I needed to take care of that. 